Well, thank you uh, all for keeping with us. And uh, after this uh, short coffee break and the very stimulating opening talks this morning, we are now very happy to welcome Sarah Atwood. Sarah is very well known. She's, a, she's got a world reputation in Victorian studies and anything related with Ruskinian studies. She has published extensively, uh, especially in the Ruskin Review and Bulletin and uh, 19th Century Prose, the Journal of Pyrophyllite Studies, Carlite Studies Annual. And her book, entitled Ruskin's Educational Ideals, was published with Ashgate in uh, 2011. Um, she has contributed to Yale University Press, on the edition of Carlyle's on heroes and hero worship, um, and about John Ruskin as well, uh, John Ruskin, 19th century education, which was published last year, actually, a very recent uh, work. Um, she has a, another book in progress uh, entitled Victorian Environmental Nightmares. So chapter in that one. Yeah. It's just a chapter, mm -hmm. but still, uh, Sarah has been extremely active. And very soon, after this conference next week, Sarah is going to be traveling back to the United States to open um, a new exhibition at Harvard University on February the 13th, uh, an exhibition entitled Victorian Visionary. Um, uh, which will be centered on the work donated by Dyke Benjamin, who was a collector of uh, all sorts of material, uh, first editions, manuscripts, and related with Ruskin and Ruskiniana. So uh, we're now going to listen to Sarah talking about overhopefulness and getting on nets, Ruskin, nature, and America. Thank Thanks. you, Sarah. Thank you for that very generous introduction. I appreciate that. So Ruskin and America, um, kind of a conflicted relationship. Ruskin never, he had American friends and admirers. He was an important influence upon the development of American art, but he was often critical of America and he never visited the United States. As he pronounced witheringly in Forest Clavigera, he could not, even for a couple of months, live in a country so miserable as to possess no castles. Writing in gadfly mode in Forrest's letter one in January of 1871, he pronounced that he would like to destroy without rebuilding the city of New York. I kind of take that to heart since I lived in New York for seven years, went to grad school there, and loved that city. Ruskin distrusted America's faith in democracy and was discouraged by its lack of long established historical and cultural traditions and a corresponding delight in novelty. Do not attempt to learn from America, he urged in 1877. An Englishman has brains enough to discover for himself what is good for England and should learn when he is to be taught anything from his fathers, not from his children. He was wary as well of American optimism, which seemed to him naive and facile. As he saw it, the Americans as a nation set their trust in liberty and in equality, of which I detest the one and deny the possibility of the other. As a nation, they are wholly undesirous of rest and incapable of it irreverent of themselves, both in the present and in the future, discontented with what they are, yet having no ideal of anything which they desire to become. He considered America to be even more afflicted with mammon worship than England, and described the American, quote, skill of degradation and discouraging reverence. While his dis dismissive remarks about America are sometimes leavened with the odd kind admission, he's more often to be found, as he put it, going into the Americans as hard as I can Writing to Harriet Beecher Stowe in 1860, he describes America as a sort of purgatory. And though his tone is light, he isn't really joking. What a dreadful thing, he says, that people should have to go to America again after coming to Europe. It seems to me an inversion of the order of nature. I think America is a sort of United States of probation, out of which all wise people, being once delivered and having obtained entrance into this better world, should never be expected to return. America was for him too raw, too graspingly eager and uncultured, an upstart crow of a nation lacking the sense to beautify itself even with borrowed plumage. There was cause for despair, he felt, in the overhopefulness and getting onness of America and its atmosphere of calculation. The distaste that Ruskin felt for American culture and politics also colored his attitude towards the landscapes that he would never see in person. 
Having described America as fresh, pure, and very ugly in an 1856 letter to his American friend Charles Eliot Norton, Ruskin defended his impertinence by instancing some American landscape paintings he had recently seen, which showed that the ugliness of the country must be unfathomable, and by describing the fruitless efforts of a young American lady to whom he had been giving drawing lessons, whose eyes, he said, had been so accustomed to ugliness that she caught at it wherever she could find it, even amidst the most beautiful English scenery. She lacked, Ruskin claimed, the English painter's perception of beauty and interest in nature. And Ruskin's own profound of nature was rooted in a close observation of and interaction with the natural world. It was strengthened by literary, artistic, and historical associations uniquely connected to the European cultural tradition. His understanding of history was informed by the long ages of Europe, which fed his strong sense of place. The landscapes he loved were rich with meaning and memory. Our children's taste, he explained to American artist W.J. Stillman in 1851, is fed with ruins of abbeys. Such associations, he proposed in Modern Painters III, can only be felt by the modern European child, rising eminently out of the contrast of the beautiful past with the frightful, frightful and monotonous present. The instinct to which it appeals can hardly be felt in America, and every day that either beautifies our present architecture and dress or overthrows a stone of medieval monument contributes to weaken it in Europe. Ruskin's understanding of the natural world was connected by all manner of strange intellectual cords and nerves with the pathos and history of this old English country of ours, and on the other side, with the history of the European mind from earliest mythology down to modern rationalism and irrationalism. The American vision of nature lacked the elements that Ruskin most valued. In an 1875 letter to Norton, Ruskin wrote, you cannot have in America the forms of mental rest soothed with memory of other far distant sorrow, not our own, which is so beautiful in these old countries. How different for a man like you, a walk by our riversides under Bolton or Furness, or in Cloister of Vallombrosa or Chartreuse, from any blank cessation from absolute toil in that new land. Given Ruskin's attitude towards America and his intensely personal and cultural understanding of nature, it's unsurprising that there should be fundamental and important differences between his perception of the natural world and that of such influential contemporary Americans as Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, and John Muir, despite a shared love of nature and sense of its spiritual power. 19th century Americans were torn between the need to construct a culture of their own and the venerable European tradition. As a young country, still trying to define itself, America lacked Europe's cultural confidence. Something of this anxiety underlies Emerson's bold calls for self-reliance and a uniquely American tradition. In his first published book, Nature, 1836, Emerson asks, why should we grope among the dry bones of the past or put the living generation into masquerade out of its faded wardrobe? There are new lands, new men, new thoughts. Let us demand our own works and laws and worship. He urged readers to overcome their cultural unease. Our day of dependence, he said, our long apprenticeship to the learning of other lands draws to a close. We have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. The spirit of the American free man is already suspected to be timid, timid, imitative, tame. Although it has often been misrepresented as such, this is not an argument for American exceptionalism. Emerson never shrank from identifying national failings. His resistance to European influence was rooted in the cultural anxiety of influence. My whole philosophy, Emerson de declared in 1841, which is very real, teaches acquiescence and optimism. Sure I am that the right word, word will be spoken, though I cut out my own tongue. Emerson's optimism sprang from America's newness and his sense of its potential. In English traits, he remarks that for all the sense, spirit, and success of the English, I surely know that as soon as I return to Massachusetts, I shall lapse at once into the feeling, which the geography of America inevitably inspires, that we play the game with immense advantage and that England, an old and exhausted island, must one day be contented, like other parents, to be strong only in her children. Although Emerson recognized the damaging effects of industrialism and capitalism on the natural world, he believed that wisdom would ultimately prevail. His study of nature led him to conclude that every stone will fall where it is due. We need not assist the administration of the universe. Emerson's optimism shaped his doctrine of compensation, according to which justice is not postponed, a perfect equity adjusts its balance in all parts of life. Every secret is told, every crime is punished, every virtue rewarded, every wrong redressed in silence and certainty. 
Now, Ruskin was not without hope, but Emerson's optimism seemed to him ingenuous. I fancy Emerson's essay on compensation must have been written when he was very comfortable, Ruskin remarked in 1866. For Emerson, nature was more symbolic than particular. Every natural fact is a symbol of some spiritual fact, he intoned. R.B. Stein points out that although Ruskin used the transcendental argument to make nature more meaningful, he did not see nature as symbolic in the sense that Emerson did. Nature for Ruskin was metaphorical or allegorical rather than the basis for a symbolic vision. It was also immediate and particular. Throughout his life and work, Ruskin paid close attention to the natural world in all its detail and materiality. And Ruskin's thinking was similarly at odds with that of Henry David Thoreau and John Muir, the American high priests of nature. Although Muir was Scottish by birth, he lived all his adult life in America, becoming one of the country's most famous naturalists and conservationists. Thoreau read, read all five volumes of Modern Painters. He read The Seven Lamps of Architecture and the Elements of Drawing and was greatly stirred by Ruskin. He was drawn to Ruskin's passion for and close observation of nature, his powerful prose, and his prophetic voice. He was impressed by Ruskin's discussion of color and the elements of drawing. Robert D. Richardson observed Ruskin's influence in Thoreau's 1857 essay, Autumnal Tints, noting that in its emphasis on seeing, its attention to visual detail, and above all in its excitement and reveling in color, the essay owed much of its brilliance to Thoreau's excited reading of Ruskin. Laura Dassa Walls agrees, remarking that Ruskin showed Thoreau how to see autumn through an artist's eye. Thoreau was especially taken with Ruskin's concept of the innocent eye, a way of seeing things without consciousness of what they signify. Yet he was critical of what he considered Ruskin's contradictory practice of viewing nature through a cultural lens, what he called an artist's and critic's design. Too often, Thoreau felt, Ruskin wanted to see nature through art. As H. Daniel Peck observes, this judgment is enormously unfair to Ruskin, whose search for nature's meaning, especially its symmetry, was in many respects as deeply probing as Thoreau's, and many of us here might feel that it was more probing. For Ruskin, the concept of the innocent eye relates to the technical power of painting. It's a part, not the sum of full perception. As Ruskin makes clear, in the mind of the man who has most the power of contemplating the thing itself, all perceptions and trains of idea are partially present, not distinctly, but in a mingled and perfect harmony. Fancy and feeling, and perception and imagination will all obscurely meet and balance themselves in him. And as he put it in a now famous declaration, to see clearly is poetry, prophecy, and religion all in one. As Ruskin was beginning to glimpse darkness in the natural world, an awareness of ecological de degradation that would result in the apop apocalyptic vision of the storm cloud of the 19th century in 1884, Thoreau was composing paeans to American wildness in the 1862 essay, Walking. According nature and almost salvific power, Thoreau famously declares that in wildness is the preservation of the world. Thoreau's essay is a statement of faith. I believe in the forest and in the meadow and in the night in which the corn grows, he proclaims, echoing the creedal formula. It's also a celebration of America's freedom from tradition, although Thoreau's insistence on the enervation of European culture suggests a distinctly American fear of inferiority. For Thoreau, the future lies to the West. The Atlantic is a Lethean stream, he writes, in our passage over which we have had an opportunity to forget the old world and its institutions. English literature in particular, he argues, is as tame and staid as the English landscape, lacking the wild strain encouraged by America's vastness and to be superseded one day by vigorous American creativity. While conceding the enduring power of myth, which he called the old crop which the old world bore before its soil was exhausted, Thoreau believes that in the future, an American mythology will provide a fresh source of inspiration. Everything is bigger, brighter, wilder, and more inspiring in America, Thoreau enthuses. If the heavens of America appear infinitely higher and stars brighter, I trust these facts are symbolical of the height to which the philosophy and poetry and religion of her inhabitants may one day soar. For I believe that climate does thus react on man. Will not man grow to greater perfection intellectually as well as physically under these circumstances? Or is it unimportant how many foggy days there are in his life? I trust that we shall be more imaginative, our thoughts will be clearer, fresher, and more ethereal as our sky, our understanding more comprehensive and broader like our plains, our intellect generally on a grander scale, like our thunder and lightning, our rivers and mountains and forests, 
and our hearts shall even correspond in breadth and depth and grandeur to our inland seas. This vision of nature depends on leaving the past behind, shedding the very influences that shaped Ruskin's understanding of the natural world. Whereas Ruskin identified the want of historical associations as a particular American deficiency, Thoreau declared that he is blessed over all mortals who loses no moment of the passing life in remembering the past. As Dominic Green points out, Ruskin could look back to the medieval unities and the nature of Gothic. Thoreau had only the Neolithic past of Indian arrowheads and the speaking cosmos and the quiet desperation of a revolutionary. Nor does Thoreau acknowledge the dark side of nature that troubled Ruskin. In the East, Thoreau writes, fancy and imagination are affected with blight, but westward lies the Holy Land, where one day the sun shall shine more brightly than ever he has done and light up our whole lives with a great awakening light. John Muir, too, objected to Ruskin's account of darkness in nature. Reading modern painters in the 1870s, Muir wrote to a friend, how cordially I disbelieve him tonight, and were he to dwell a while amongst the powers of these mountains, he would forget all dictionary differences betwixt the clean and the unclean, and he would lose all memory and meaning of the diabolical, sin-begotten term, foulness. Of course, Ruskin had dwelt among the mountains, and the powerful contrast he drew between mountain gloom and mountain glory was the result of close observation. For all his love of the natural world and conviction of its divinely influenced beauty, Ruskin warned against a naively sentimental view of nature. In the utmost solitudes of nature, he wrote, the existence of hell seems to me as legibly declared by a thousand spiritual utterances as that of heaven. It is well for us to dwell with thankfulness of the unfolding of the flower and the falling of the dew and the sleep of the green fields in the sunshine. But the blasted trunk, the barren rock, the moaning of the bleak winds, the roar of the black, perilous, merciless whirlpools of the mountain streams, the solemn solitudes of moors and seas, the continual fading of all beauty into darkness and of all strength into dust, have these no language for us? We may seek to escape their teaching by reasoning, touching the good which is wrought out of all evil, but it is vain sophistry. The good succeeds to the evil as day succeeds the night, but so also the evil to the good. John Muir would have none of it. Responding to this passage in an 1873 letter to J.B. McChesney, he declared, I know something about the blasted trunk and the barren rock, the moaning of the bleak winds, and they have a language for me. They declare nothing of wrath or of hell, only love plain as was ever spoken. Muir saw only the ineffable beauty and harmony of nature. For him, even the most destructive of storms was productive of a glorious perfection that revealed nature's essential goodness and wisdom. Like Ruskin, Muir was a keen observer of the natural world. Both men believed in an essential bond between man and nature and were distressed to see it weakened by the pressure of economic and cultural change. It's likely that Ruskin, who had protested the expansion of the railway into his beloved Lake District and the conversion of Thirlmere into a reservoir, would have approved Muir's conservation efforts. And there are especially close parallels between Ruskin's failed efforts on the part of Thirlmere and Muir's lost battle for Yosemite's Hetch Hetchy Valley. But Muir, a great admirer of both Emerson and Thoreau, found their transcendental philosophy more appealing. In the same letter to McChesney, Muir praised Ruskin's steel-tempered sentences, but once again criticized what he saw as Ruskin's hopelessness and his emphasis on the dualities of nature, good and evil, dark and light, life and death. Muir failed to see that Ruskin's use of linguistic dualisms does not mean that his vision is dualist. Muir declares Ruskin an infidel to nature. You can never feel that there is the slightest union betwixt nature and him, which seems an odd thing to say for any of us who have read Ruskin on nature. Ruskin lives, Muir insists, beneath a bell glass, his vision occluded by the heaviest and most opaque stuff in the universe, a thousand times denser than hammered steel. There's a good deal more in this vein, and one wonders at Muir's apparent inability or refusal to understand Ruskin's meaning. Terry Gifford cautions against an uncritical acceptance of Muir's strictures, suggesting that Muir may have learned from Ruskin the multiple modes of discourse that enabled him to move between lyrical descriptive prose, scientific inquiry, and angry preaching, as well as a concern for the environment and human life. Gifford argues that Muir's resistance to aspects of Ruskin's language has clouded Muir's ability to see the whole of what Ruskin is saying, with which he would have had sympathy, with the result that Muir's is not a reading of Ruskin at all, but a misreading. 
After 1886, Gifford, Gifford maintains, Muir used Ruskin to more clearly define his own thinking, seeking not only to learn from Ruskin, but to forge his own vision, at the same time distancing himself from Ruskin's example and what might be interpreted as another instance of cultural and intellectual anxiety. Among those Americans who studied and wrote about nature, Ruskin has more in common with George Perkins Marsh, whose Man and Nature, published in 1864, is an attempt to study the harmful effects of the human impact on the natural world and to encourage wise future practice. Marsh's pragmatism contrasts with the traditional American glorification of wildness. Ruskin owned a copy of Man and Nature, and although he does not comment on it in his own work, one expects he must have found appealing Marsh's blend of scientific and cultural knowledge, his commitment to close observation, and his rejection of narrow specialization. While Ruskin read several of Emerson's books, heard news of him through their mutual friend Carlyle, and met him on one occasion in 1873, he does not mention Thoreau or Muir and does not appear to have owned any of their books. Marsh's tone and style are quite different from Ruskin's, and his book is systematic and data-driven. But he nonetheless shares Ruskin's vision of connection and relation and repeatedly links nature, culture, science, and history. He also expresses a Ruskinian belief in the power of sight, declaring that the power most important to cultivate and at the same time hardest to acquire is that of seeing what is before him. Sight is a faculty, seeing an art. Although known and respected amongst academics, conservationists, and environmentalists, neither Marsh nor his practical, sober work attained the popular fame accorded to Emerson's oracular mysticism or to the visionary spirituality of Thoreau and Muir. Concerned to establish a uniquely American story and tradition, Emerson, Thoreau, and Muir interpreted nature signs differently than Ruskin, who read what he called the living hieroglyph of nature through a lens of history, culture, and experience. Despite many apparent correspondences and points of sympathy with these Americans, Ruskin's ideas had been forged in a different fire and bore the marks of its distinctive tempering. Thank you very, very much uh, uh, to Professor Andwood for this uh, fantastic introduction to the um, American reception of Ruskin and, uh, well, the reception and the, um, I would say, the understanding or misunderstanding around uh, Ruskin's uh, thought and, uh, uh, and writings. And it is now a joy to welcome Professor George Landau. Uh, some of you here already know him. I guess almost everybody here at least knows his name because George is uh, uh, internationally known uh, as the, uh, um, the, the founder and the webmaster of the Victorian web, uh, which is so useful as a, a pedagogical resource. And uh, I'm sure many of our students here uh, enjoy using the Victorian web. But apart from that, uh, Professor Lando has uh, published extensively about Victorian art, Victorian ideas, and about John Ruskin. Um, he uh, also uh, wrote extensively and thought a lot about the relationship between the text and the hypertext, and this was the topic of uh, George's lecture yesterday. Uh, some of his... Uh, uh, writings as in print have been translated in many, many languages, especially hypertext, the three versions of the hypertext, uh, which is subtitled uh, Critical Theory and New Media in an Era of Globalization. So, um, uh, uh, Professor Lando has also published uh, books uh, about uh, Victorian thinkers such as Carlyle and Naylor uh, in Elegant Jeremias, and also um, on, um, on images and uh, text and image relationship, for example, in uh, Images of Crisis. Um, another very influential book was uh, Victorian Types and Victorian Shadows, Biblical Typology in Victorian Literature, Art and Thought in which um, he uh, combined uh, paintings with uh, writing and also uh, philosophy. 
and this was a very, very influential book um, to all of us, I guess. And today, uh, Professor Lando's talk is going to uh, be entitled Ruskin, Credibility and Power. So please welcome Professor Lando. So this is our beginning question. How do authors or speakers achieve power over the audience? Which is a morally questionable relationship, one has to admit. Why do audiences believe? Why do they relinquish power to speakers? Well, Aristotle famously said there were three ways to convince people. Logos or reason, and examples would be logic, statistics, unambiguous factual information, which of course rarely exists. And he points out that that really convinces very few people. The arguments are hard to come by. People do, may not agree on the parts of a syllogism. Well, there's pathos. That's the appeal to emotions. You could appeal to a love of person, of party, of country, or you could attack. But he said that in any field, any argument, any question where there's a lot of gray instead of black and white, you convince people primarily by ethos or establishing credibility. Essentially, the author says, you can believe me. That's all of it. And he points out this is the only method of convincing in political arguments. Now, so he says persuasion is achieved by the speaker's personal character. And you can read the rest of this. So the question we have is what kind of literary techniques, in this case, did John Ruskin employ successfully capture his audience attention and then, in many cases, belief. Well, part of it is, reader, I was there. Ruskin's citations are personal experience closely related to this. And as David Delora has observed, this derives largely from his need to create ethos by suggesting to the reader that he's tested on his own pulse these ideas. So much of Ruskin's most important work though we'll see not in traffic, functions and manners analogous to in memoriam, making the claim, reader, I was there, I experienced it. And many times, as when he shows us that the color of a shadow on grass is purple and not as many of us think brown, or how reflections and double reflections work on water, you say, oh, I never saw that before. You go out and you look and you say, by God, he's right. Then you go back to the book and you are willing to believe something which you might not. Ruskin also admits he's wrong at times. Particularly the later editions of modern painters, he would point to his earlier evangelical parochialism. And instead of correcting the text, he would leave it there and point out, look how wrong I was and that's why you have to move away from this kind of thing. You have to be a very, very confident author to point out your mistakes and just leave them out there. And for example, he admits he's wrong about the paintings of Elizabeth Thompson, Lady Butler. And he said, this was a gigantic painting. He says, I never approached a picture with more iniquitous prejudice against it than I did Miss Thompson's. Partly because I've always said no women could paint and secondly, because I thought what the public had made a fuss about it must be good for nothing. But it is Amazon's work. This is no doubt the first fine paraphilite picture of battle we have had, profoundly interesting and showing all manner of illustrative and realistic faculty. Of course, all that needs to be said about it on this side must have been said 20 times over in the journals. And it remains only for me to make my tardy genuflection on the trampled corn before this palace of Pall Mall. 
So Ruskin does this with others. He will say, I was wrong. This person is really can do this very well. But then he could another way, his primary way of saying, reader, I was there, is this what I would call a literature of experience. Now Ruskin recreates, that is he shapes or fictionalizes experience for the reader in his discussion of Claude's Lodice. Now typically it's part of an argument. Now it turns out the critics were comparing late Turner and his paintings to this particular picture and Ruskin said if you look at it you can tell it's a terrible picture it's not by Claude but if you want to consider it by Claude and compare it to Turner I'll do that so he has three forms of uh, word painting this one. he can place a, stat a static spectator a camera eye and view movement he can also animate landscape with strong verbs or he can create a moving center of description, and this is Ruskin's proto-cinematic prose. Here's an example of a spectator uh, who's standing in one place, and before the person's eyes, there's movement. I remember once when crossing the Tête Noire, I had turned up the Ballet Toastrien, and I noticed a rain cloud form on the Glacier de Triomphe. With a west wind, it proceeded towards the Col de Balme being followed by a prolonged reef of vapor, always forming at exactly the same spot over the glacier. This long, serpent-like line of cloud went on at a great rate till it reached the valley leading down from the Col de Balme under the slate rocks of the Quad Affair. Then it turned sharp round and came down this valley at right angles. And he goes on, it's always forming and always disappearing at the same place. Well, another thing is animating the landscape just with strong verbs. Ruskin knows when to use is and passives and when not to. Seven miles to the north of Venice, the banks of sand which nearer the city rise little above the low water mark attain by degrees and knit themselves at last into fields of salt morass, raised here and there into shapeless mounds and intercepted by narrow creeks of sea. But let's look at the action with the, the proto-cinematic prose. It establishes a visual center, a seeing camera-like eye. And like modern cinema, or even the earliest cinema, it uses, moves the eye in or out of a scene, or parts of it, and pans the eye across the scene. So this is the Claude Lorraine comparison, or pseudo-Claude. Not long ago, I was slowly descending this very bit of carriage road that was depicted in this other painting. The first turn after you leave Obano. It had been wild weather when I left Rome, and all across the Campania, the clouds were sweeping in sulfurous blue with a clap of thunder or two and breaking gleams of sun along the Claudian aqueduct lighting up the infinity of its arches like the bridge of chaos. But as I climbed the long slope of the Alban Mount, the swarm swept finally to the north, and the noble outline of the domes of Albano and the graceful darkness of its ilex grove rose against pure streaks of alternate blue and amber, the upper sky gradually flushing through the last fragments of rain cloud in deep palpitating azure half ether and half dew. The noonday sun came slanting down the rocky slopes of Alicia and their masses of entangled and tall foliage whose autumnal tints were mixed with wet verdure of a thousand evergreens were penetrated with it, tints were mixed, sorry, with it uh, as with rain. I cannot call it color, it was conflagration, purple and crimson and scarlet like the curtains of God's tabernacle. All of these, by the way, are allusions to the book of Leviticus and the Old Testament, which his evangelically raised, uh, educated uh, readers would have seen echoes of this. Uh, this is T.S. Eliot, like parody and playing with ideas for secular reasons 
uh, for a different type of reverence or a different type of questioning. Well, it goes all the way through it, and uh, I leave it to you to read uh, the rest. But the, so what is he doing here? Well, he's explicitly comparing the experience of looking at the painting to his experience. He's implicitly comparing this to opposing critics' views. And most importantly, you would say, he's for the rhetorical value, he's comparing it to your experience of a landscape, making you wonder, have I ever seen a powerful landscape and actually seen these things in it? Now, these are the gentler forms of argument. And these appear in his earlier books on art and architecture. And they function as interludes among the voice of the Ruskin most of us probably remember when we're not thinking of the word painting. The assertive, the lecturing, the hectoring, even threatening voice of traffic unto this last and fours. The voice that derives from the Old Testament prophets via the, from the person who created what we think of as Victorianism, Thomas Carlyle. Because so it was Carlyle who really urges that we take what we'd say in class is the public address and voice of the Augustans of the 18th century and combine it with the personal experience, the subjective experience of the Romantics and out of this produce a new synthesis. Or as Carlyle puts it, close your Byron, open your Goethe. Many people would say, you know, close your Byron, open your Carlyle, or, or your Ruskin, and as they did. Now, the genre which Carlyle essentially created in the signs of the times, it draws on patterns from the Old Testament biblical prophecy, Jeremiah, Isaiah, and these, the people in England knew this because this is the kind of thing you would find in family of Bibles at the beginning of Isaiah and various things. They would explain the prophetic pattern. This is not something one has to go and you know, find in some arcane place. People learn to read, particularly members of the lower classes and middle classes, often to learn to read so that they could read the Bible. That's how they were taught. And so even if you become an atheist, you still have these allusions and these things in mind. There have been several books written and in which demonstrate how uh, various people who moved away from Christianity uh, all through the 19th century know that they can communicate with their audience because they have virtually memorized the Bible. So what is this pattern? First, you point to some contemporary phenomena. It's usually a disaster of some kind. Why don't people have work? Why is work so demeaning? Why do people build such ugly things? You interpret it, and you show your audience, your peers, that the mess is their fault because they've abandoned the ways of God and nature, which may be same or may be different, depending on the particular sage. And they predict final disaster if the audience continues its evil course, and if you end with a hopeful vision, which often cites uh, the language and the images of paradise. So the Ruskinian and Carlylian sage, it's a unique genre because unlike almost any other kind of writing, you start out by attacking the audience. This is very, very high risk. And that's one reason that this kind of writing is so episodic because you have to try over and over again to achieve believability. Once you've told people, basically, you're idiots, <laughs> you're corrupt, you're following false prophets, you're going, you're going, to, you're going right to disaster. You, know? uh, you won't even be able to enjoy things. You're going to the death of pleasure, as the end traffic says near the end. Well, you've got to find some way of getting them to listen to you. So how does Ruskin do it? Well, one thing is the definition, and often the satiric redefinition, of words. 
So what does Ruskin do to the word taste in traffic, political economy, and unto this last, which you've already heard about today? And the same way Carlyle does to machine. One of the most brilliant works that unrecognized, I think, for such is Carlyle's Signs of the Times, because he points out that things like committees are a form of technology. He, I mean, uh, this was a century and a half ahead of his time to understand how we technologize our life in social formations. Well, another is to use grotesque analogies and examples. The sage presents such unexpected meanings and obviously important contemporary phenomena in two forms, either ones that you, he finds in everyday life <clears throat> or those he makes up. So what do they tell us about what the sages think about contemporary life? That it's grotesque. Now many of these things, particularly in Ruskin, take the form of apparently uh, unimportant things like advertising signs. Uh, Carlyle, for example, uh, approaches the way economics are destroying our soul by showing people with sandwich boards advertising on Oxford Street. And he says, instead of creating better things, we're creating false words about things. Ruskin looks at a pub railing and goes back and says, why is this there so that garbage can collect behind it? It's to keep people from resting there, or staying there. And how was this manufactured? And what did it cost to the people who made it? And by the time he's finished, as in all of these things, it pierces into the heart of society. So here's a found grotesque. Found in a newspaper. They use newspaper articles all the time. So whether or not the sages uh, make fun of journalism, uh, the way Trollope did in, in The Warden, nonetheless, this is where they find their evidence over and over again because this is like a modern Bible. Everyone will have read it to that extent. Lately, in a wreck of a California ship, one of the passengers fastened a belt about him with 200 pounds of gold about it, with which he was found afterwards at the bottom. Now, as he was sinking, had he the gold or had the gold him? Ruskin is talking about the, this is before he introduces the idea of there's no wealth but life, and he's pointing out we have to re redefine possession, we have to redefine wealth, we have to re redefine power. So here's another one. Your Greek worshiped wisdom and built you a Parth the Parthenon, the Virgin's Temple. Did a medieval worship consolation and built you virgin temples also, but to Our Lady of Salvation. Then the revivalist worshiped beauty of a sort and built you Versailles and the Vatican. Now lately, will you tell me what we worship and what we build? You know, we're speaking always of the real, active, continual, national worship. Now that's by which men act while they live, not that they talk about when they die. Now we indeed have a nominal religion to which we pay tithes of property and sevenths of time, we go to church on Sunday. But we also have a practical and earnest religion to which we devote nine-tenths of our property and six-sevenths of our time. And we dispute a great deal about the nominal religion. Think of all the religious controversies in England, in Victorian England at this period, which is why, if any of you know the Victorian web, there is such a large section on religion because the religion of England the, uh, and the experience of English writers dramatically differs from that of people on the continent, in part because of the evangelical revival. Now, once I mention evangelical revival, I have to mention that Ruskin is here borrowing and parroting one of the most popular books of the 19th century, of which I'm sure almost none of you, if any of you, have ever heard. And its short title is Practical Christianity. It's a very, very long title, and it is exactly what Ruskin's ta talking about. What do you really worship in? But this is a deeply evangelical work written by William Wilberforce, who is known for leading the anti-slavery movement. He was also in Parliament, and he wrote this book, which went through dozens of editions. Uh, 
And Ruskin basically has taken his ideas and just repurposed them in the middle of a what is a political tract, not a religious tract. So there are reverberations going back and forth. People are encountering things which most of them have encountered elsewhere, and he's twisting it. And they're basically, he's trying to reset the way they think. Then he says what we believe in, let me uh, go back. But you will admit that the ruling goddess may best be generally described as the goddess of getting on, or Britannia of the market. So immediately after his claim that his readers have thus separated your religion from your life, a charge you will expand upon when he argues that they're really pagans, he assumes the preacher's voice in order to prove to his audience that religion cannot be isolated from other human affairs, he begins, as he so frequently does, by citing scripture, even though at this point, Ruskin is a non-believer and very possibly an atheist. I suspect he's an atheist, not an agnostic at this particular period. But he does it, as does Carlyle and as do many others like Arnold, because this is the language of in which people are used to hearing serious topics discussed. And many times he uses it not hypocritically. He says, you say you believe this. Let's look at how you act in relation to it. Now, he had made elaborate use of scripture to argue for the importance of lavishing expenditure on building churches in the seven lamps of architecture. And what he does is he goes to the Levitical argument and who today reads the book of Leviticus, and shows how it was understood uh, typologically. And one of the little scholarly thrills one gets, one gets excited when one discovers things. And of course, no one else in your family, much less in your classes, cares about this. But it turns out that the Ruskin Museum has Ruskin's, I think he was nine years old, when he wrote this summary of a sermon, and that sermon is on the exact text and the exact interpretation he uses years later in Seven Lamps of Architecture. I mean, it is so rare in scholarship you get a chance to really nail down a topic. I mean, there's no doubt where this comes from at, at this point. That's so much fun, at least for me. Well, Ruskin made elaborate use of scripture to argue for the importance of, sorry, that, and the sacred nature of color in the fifth volume of Modern Painters. And other, you know, he argues that God must be worshiped everywhere, not only in buildings set aside. I'm going backwards for some reason now, and I don't know why. Let me go forward. So. And then, it's, remember, he's been called to Bradford, right outside of Manchester, to advise people on building a corn exchange, which I think is really a wheat exchange, for what Americans would call it, or grain. All your great architectural works are, of course, built to her, the goddess of getting on. It's a long time since you built a cathedral. And how you'd laugh at me if I proposed building a cathedral on top of one of these hills of yours to make it a necropolis. But your railroad mounds vaster than the walls of Babylon. And notice what he's comparing the walls to. Uh, your railroad stations vaster than the temple of Ephesus and innumerable. Your t chimneys, how much more mighty and costly than cathedral spires. Your harbor piers, your warehouses, your exchanges. Of course, he's been here to talk about an exchange. All these are built to your great goddess of getting on, and she has formed and will continue to form your architecture as long as you worship her. And it's vain to ask me to tell you how to build her. You know far better than I. Well, that's, then he goes from that to the invented grotesque. Well, this is what the worship of the goddess of getting on is, according to Charles. For his audience, the wealthy upper middle class and upper class, uh, including the nobility, and after all, some of the greatest coal fields were owned by 
members of landed nobility. Your ideal of human life is, I think, that it should be passed in a pleasant, undulating world with iron and coal everywhere beneath it. On such pleasant bank of this world is to be a beautiful mansion with two wings and stables and coach houses, a moderately sized park, a large garden and hot houses, and pleasant carriage drives through the shrubberies. In this mansion are to live the favorite votaries of the goddess, the English gentleman, with his gracious wife and beautiful family. He always able to have the boudoir and the jewels for his wife and the beautiful ball dresses for his daughters and hunters for sons and shooting in the highlands for himself. At the bottom of the bank is to be the mill, not less than a quarter of a mile long with one steam engine at each end and two in the middle and a chimney three feet high. In this mill ought to be in constant employment from 800 to 1,000 workers who never drink, never strike, always go to church on Sunday, and always express themselves in respectful language. Now, another technique he uses after hitting these, because he's been hitting them over and over and over, the, many of the people in his audience will have heard these words used about sinners over and over again, and now they're being applied to him they're being applied to them indirectly because he recognizes what he's talking about. One of the things the sage will use, Ruskin is brilliant, is when he uses you and when he switches it to us. That's when he believes he has achieved credibility with the audience and now can then recommend different things. But you think you might as well have the right thing for your money you know there are a great many odd styles of architecture about you. You don't want to do anything ridiculous. You hear of me, among others, as a respectable architectural man milliner. And of course, milliners were among the least respectable of uh, female workers. And he's comparing himself, he's denigrating himself because he says, this is what you really think of me. I mean, this is, uh, here in this case, he's pretending to be hopeful and is being really insulting. You send for me that I may tell you the leading fashion and what in our shops for the moment, the newest and sweetest thing in pinnacles. This is a different use of sweetest than we heard before. This is a parody of it all. Oh, no. I, but then he switches. I know that none of this wrong is done with deliberate purpose. I know on the contrary, you wish your workmen that well, you do much for them and that you desire more for them if you saw your way to such benevolence safely. I know that even all this wrong and misery are brought about by a warped sense of duty and all, suddenly it's our hearts have been betrayed by the plausible impiety of the modern economist telling us that to do the best for ourselves is finally to do the best for others. Friends, our great master not said, said not so. And most absolutely, we will find this world is not made so. Well, then there's the invented uh, grotesque uh, continued, another one. Suppose Ruskin instructs his listeners, he'd been sent for by a private gentleman living in a suburban house who wants to decorate the house. Because it's very analogous to the way you brought me here. And suppose I see that, you know, he says he finds the walls bare, and he suggests rich furnishings, you know, maybe frescoes on the ceiling, and pointing, and the guy says he can't afford it. Pointing out that the client is supposed to be a wealthy man, like the people in Bradford. He's told, ah, yes, but you know, at present I'm obliged to spend it all nearly on steel traps. Steel traps? For whom? Why, for the fellow on the other side of the wall, you know, we're very good friends, capital friends, but we are obliged to keep our traps set on both sides of the wall. We could not possibly keep on friendly terms without them and our spring guns. The worst of it is we're both fellow, clever fellows enough, and there's never a day passes that we don't find a new trap or a new gun barrel or something. So at this point, he turns to the audience, he says, this is a highly comic state of life for two private gentlemen. 
but for two nations, it seems to me, not wholly comic. He goes on, Bedlam might be comic if it had only one madman and Christmas pantomimes the co comic the one cloud, clown. But when the whole world turns uh, clown and paints itself red with its hearts for blood instead of vermilion, it's something else than comic, I think. Or I should say comic, comma, I think. He's undercut. So what are the characteristic literary techniques of Ruskin sage writing? Well, one of the basis really is the virtuoso act of interpretation. Like the prophet, he explains unexpected meanings and obvious things. And by finding meanings important to the reader in apparently trivial things where we began, he demonstrates his skills. So we've been through this. I'm not going to look at this again. Let's see where are we? Uh, so he ends with a prophetic warning, the, the final, the, the penultimate move. You will tell me I not, need not preach against these things, for I can't mend them. No, good friends, I cannot, but you can. And you will. Or something else can and will. Even good things have no abiding power. And shall all these evil things that you're doing, persist in victorious evil, all history shows, on the contrary, that to be the exact thing they never can do. Change must come, but it's to ours to determine whether it be change of growth or change of death. Shall the Parthenon be in ruins on its rock, and Bolton Priory in its meadow, but these mills of yours be the consummation of the buildings of the earth, and their wheels be as the wheels of eternity? Think of you that men may come and men may go, but mills go on forever? Not so. Out of these, better or worse shall come. It's up for you to decide which. It keeps going backwards, so let me get that right. I don't know what I was doing. Uh, and then he has the prophetic close. Continue to make that forbidden deity your principal one. Soon, no more art. No more science, no pleasure will be possible. Catastrophe will come, or worse than catastrophe, a slow moldering and withering into haze. Hades. I think that's uh, Eliot, T.S. Eliot, obviously. But if you can fix some conception of true human life to be striven for, here's the positive move. Life good for all men as for yourselves. If you can determine some honest, and simple order of existence, following those trodden ways of wisdom, which are pleasantness, and seeking her quiet and withdrawn paths, which are peace. This is just interwoven with scriptural references. If you don't know them, it's powerful. If you do know them, it's, it just reverberates over and over again. Then, in so sanctifying wealth into commonwealth, all your art, your literature, your daily labors, your domestic affection and citizen's duty will join and increase into one magnificent harmony. You will know then how to build well enough. You will build with stone well, but with flesh better. Temples not made with hands, but riveted of hearts. And that kind of marble, crimson veiled, feigned, is indeed eternal. That's it. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, George, and thank you very much, Sarah, for these two very exciting talks. And I was interested in uh, how, in fact, they reverberate and uh, how the, the concept of getting on there was uh, recuperated in two different ways. <laughs> Is that something you would like maybe to comment on? <laughs> no, you go first, because I, I think <laughs> your American prophets <laughs> work very, very well. Um, but I think the reason I wanted to talk about Russian and, and America is because I've done work on Ruskin and Emerson before, and I'm doing more work on Ruskin and Thoreau and, and Muir. But in doing that research, I just 
was really struck by the difference in their vantage point. I mean, they're coming from two very different, um, you know, worldviews about, in this case, nature. I'm talking about nature, um, but also in, in general about um, government, about um, labor. You know, all of these things. They have so much in common that it's, it's, it would be very easy to say, you know, Russell and Thoreau, um, Muir, Emerson. Look how much they, they shared about about mm. in their feelings about nature, especially, um, and yet. They have very different, as I said before, very different views. They come from very different starting points. And I think it's important to kind of tease that out and see what that starting point is, because it's really easy to throw them together. And they're different. I mean, they, they do love nature. They do think that nature is spiritual. And yet, um, you know, Ruskin is really looking backwards toward tradition, you know, towards European culture, um, memory, association, all of these things when he writes about nature. And as you can see with what Thoreau says, he's looking forward. He doesn't want to look back. Um, you know, and, and Muir, is, Muir is so spiritual about nature um, that he often doesn't look at the dark side. And so, you know, the things that separate them are, to me, what's most interesting about them. Um, as far as the getting on myth, I mean, yeah. he, he sees America as a culture of getting on, um, yeah, which in many ways we still are. Uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think. It's a, it's a positive value. Uh, well, he doesn't see it as a positive value, yeah. but. Um, and, and he was very dismissive of America. Mm -hmm. uh, he never did visit, but was well, it's, fa it's fascinating yeah. how uh, Americans took to him. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if you look at the American art magazine, The Crayon, mm -hmm. every time they have a space in a column, they quote from Ruskin. They quote Stones of mm -hmm. Venice. They quote modern painters. Yeah. In other words, he is like the spirit of art. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, when some of the paintings he exhibited from uh, the early Renaissance come to New York, I believe it's to New York, mm -hmm. uh, having read what he's written about them, people are often shocked because they're not as realistic right. as he had expected, <laughs> as they, they expected. Yeah. So there's often this tremendous influence, but this kind of discontinuity that occurs uh, occasionally. Mm -hmm. So there's both influence and sort of misprison or misinfluence at, uh, at the same time. Yeah, and Ruskin says at one point, and I didn't include this quote in the paper, but um, that Americans have been misreading his books, mm -hmm. and he's tired of Americans misreading his books. So and it interests me that Ruskin was on the school syllabus in the late 19th, early mm -hmm. 20, into the early 20th yes. century. Um, he's not anymore. I mean, he is in mine <laughs> when I teach. Yes. Um, but for the most part, a lot of young people in America don't know who Ruskin is. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's really interesting to teach him now, because I find that they respond very well to Ruskin. Um, not at first, you know, the, the language kind of puts them off a bit, but when they find out that the things he's talking about are still um, so important and that he's talking about debates we're still having today, then they start to think, well, wait a minute, you know, this, this man has something to say to us. Um, but, you know, in the early part of the late 19th century, early 20th century, I mean, he was, he was assigned reading. He was in mm -hmm. the, the primers for, yep. for, for schools. And it's interesting to see that shift where, you know, Ruskin was so important to Americans as far as, you know, Concepts of art, um, especially, and then you know went through this period of um, you know being completely dropped, yeah, so, which is unfortunate. Well, all the Victorians went through yeah, that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, basically, people, the <laughs> yeah. modernists, had to create some space for mm -hmm. themselves, right? And then, then their grandchildren rediscovered the, the mm -hmm. people that their yeah. grandparents moved out of the way, and we're back. And that's happens over and over again. Yes. Well, the reason why. I happen to understand the author mm -hmm. yes, yeah. theory of yeah. neglect and exploration of yeah. that second theory. That happened in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. In uh, yes. America, I don't know. But the, uh, they were thinking of it. But the, the, the kinds of odd influence, I went to a, I must have been more than 20 years ago, to uh, a, an art history conference in America. Mm -hmm. And there was a section on Ruskin. and. Uh, one of the talks was how the uh, revival of adobe architecture in uh, New Mexico mm -hmm. was a direct Ruskinian influence. Because people, uh, and then there was someone else who gave a paper on the revival, I think it was Hungarian vernacular architecture. All these people read the part of the Stones of Venice which said don't build buildings like the Venetians did build the buildings that come out of your culture mm -hmm. and your landscape and your weather. Yeah. And so there was this explosion. At the same time, the modernists, 
like the Bauhaus, mm -hmm. are looking at Ruskin because Ruskin defended the Gothic as, no, as functional, both for the worker but functionalist. In fact, because this was in his beginnings of his unreligious phase, mm -hmm. uh, uh, when he would look at people who would say, oh, the Gothic spires are aspiring towards God, he said, no, that's nonsense. <laughs> they, have, they have a purpose for this. You know? And they have the windows because it's dark out there. You need big windows and you have small ones in Italy. Pay attention, guys. Uh, he can be very, very you know, uh, modern and uh, abrasive about th uh, things like that. But it is amazing the kind of influence he has had that has often crept under and people don't uh, realize it. Who's left me now. And I was interested, in, you know, when you were talking about the way that he uses, you know, biblical language or biblical imagery, and the fact that if you know it, um, you know, it, it heightens your experience mm. of Ruskin. But even if you don't, it's still very powerful to hear what he has to say. Mm. Um, and I kept thinking of that passage in um, the Storm Cloud where he talks about the assumption of the dragon. He says, "We worship a new Madonna now. Yes. We have the assumption of the dragon." And um, that, to me, those kinds of images are so powerful because they arrest you. You know, when you're reading, mm. they arrest you, and you stop. Um, which is the whole point of them, of course. Mm. And it's interesting in, you know, in teaching Ruskin, we're trying to get students to look at that, the language, just as you, you know, what mm. you were pointing out here, all, all the, um, the rhetorical moves that he makes, um, which, are, which feel so effortless, mm. and yet are so considered and so deliberate um, and so intentional and, um, and have such a great effect upon us. And I, I love what you did talking about um, his language and how he approaches that. Well, the example that you use of the assumption of the dragon mm. The only person who does things like that quite exactly is Swinburne. Mm -hmm. When in his uh, political stuff, he is using uh, image after image from the Bible and from, uh, in this case, usually high church readings mm -hmm. of the Bible uh, through his both blasphemous poems, mm -hmm. and political poems. Uh, and they, these people expect the readers to recognize this and one of the problems with our students, you said that people don't yeah. know Ruskin. I find most students don't know the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of Matthews. Yeah. They, don't, they don't know any of the uh, reverberations. Uh, yeah, that, and that, that uh, does pose a bit of a problem um, because people don't know the text that they're referring to. I had a student once get upset because Ruskin made some reference, um, I can't remember what text you're reading now, but to the Jews. And this, um, this student thought that it was you know, an insulting sort of reference. And I said, well, no, that's actually from a passage in the Bible. And I told him what passage it yes. was and everything. And, and then... Oh, okay. Sometimes it's a new understanding, but it's so it's really easy to, to make mistakes like that um, if you don't know the text that he's right. that he's referring to, and then there's a misunderstanding of, of his intention. Well, a, cl so. a classic example of this is when my when my wife was teaching during the '60s, and someone asked, "Why is James Fenimore Cooper not a communist?" <laughs> <laughs> Teachers laugh at that a lot more than any of the students here, I notice. <laughs> We have a few questions from the audience as well. Thank you. Um, just one observation about Ruskin going to America or not going to America. He couldn't physically have gone to America. Um, I have the same problem as he did, which is suffering from seasickness. Now, although Ruskin crossed, it, it may seem trivial, but it isn't. Although Ruskin crossed the channel, any times. It was always, um, from England to France, it was always in trepidation. And the longest sea voyage he ever took was from Naples to Palermo. And he was extremely nervous about that and extremely thankful that it was calm when he did it. So the prospect of him crossing the Atlantic was simply not, not possible. Uh, nor, indeed, going to Spain. People asked why he didn't go to Spain or Portugal to see where his father had got his, um, his money from, you couldn't go overland practically through France and across the Pyrenees. You would have to go, as Byron did, across the Bay of Biscay. Well, you couldn't pay me any amount of money to cross the Bay of Biscay in the biggest boat you could find. And, and I think the same would have applied to Ruskin, which is also why he couldn't have gone to Greece, because you'd have to do the same thing, go around and through the Mediterranean, which is why he was very pleased to go to Sicily so he could see a Greek temple. And that was fine. He didn't have to go to Greece. Um, but uh, leaving that aside, another observation to do with, with, with Muir and, and landscape that's always slightly puzzled me is that he seemed to have made no attempt to go and see British wilderness, uh, which is to say Scotland, um, the northern highlands, 
um, beyond, the furthest north I think he ever got was Dingwall, which is not exactly Highland. Um, uh, and yet he thought of himself as a Scot um, in, in background, just as his, uh, his father was. Um, he preferred, I think, to see the, the Alps, the Lake District, the man-made or man-influenced landscape. Um, and perhaps Sarah might make some comment about that. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why that is. I think it, it is odd, though, considering that the landscapes that he loved in America were the wild landscapes, and it was, he's especially associated with Yosemite in those areas. Um, I mean, I, I don't know why he chose to, to stay to the, you know, the more of the Timor landscapes when, when, he, when he traveled. Um, but it, it is an odd kind of, um, it's an odd circumstance. I don't, I don't think I have an answer. I don't know what his, what his reasons were. <laughs> because he's so associated with wild landscapes in America. Just, just a very brief comment on seasickness. There must be degrees of it. Dickens suffered very badly from seasickness and crossed the Atlantic twice or four times. And the greatest seasickness sufferer of all was Nelson. <laughs> We've left them speechless. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I think it, everybody's hungry at this Probably. point. So it, yes. May we again thank our speakers and thank you very much, Beatrice, for sharing this panel.